Good morning. Welcome to another Sunday service here at One Faith, One Christ Church. We are always thankful that you are joining in with us. We praise God for your being risen up this morning and stepped into a new day. So let us take this new day and rejoice that the Lord God is continuing to keep us, care for us, support us, maintain us, and show us the wonderful light of his son, Jesus Christ. So as we start our service every time is our call to worship, to bring you into praise with God, to bring you into worship and a wonderful service with him as we all fellowship together in this call to worship. Go with me to Psalm 98, the 98th number of Psalm, and we're going to read verses 1 through 6 to begin our worship service. So I'm calling you to worship. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation. His righteousness he has revealed in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in song, rejoice and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of a psalm, with trumpets and the sound of a horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord, the King. So let us do that. Let us shout joyfully to the Lord this morning because he is our King. He is our Redeemer. He is our Savior. Shout joyfully this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Feel free to clap with us today as we rejoice in the Lord. Amen. carry that kind of weight it was my tomb till I met you I was breathing but not alive all my failures I tried to hide it was my tomb till I met you. You called my name. I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness to your glorious day. You called my name. Thank you, Lord. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old man, Jesus, when I met you. To your glorious day, you call my name. I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness. To your glorious day, thank you, Lord. Now your mercy. 
mercy, now your mercy has saved my soul. And your freedom is all that I know. The old made new, Jesus, when I met you, you called my this morning.
from the inside, from the inside of me. You In the inside, in the inside of me, come fill my life from the inside, from the inside of me, set me on fire from the inside.
don't know about you, but I'm feeling lifted higher. I know we lift him higher. I feel a little bit higher this morning. Thanks to the grace of God and the mercy that keeps me and the mercy that keeps you. So our scripture this morning for our worship, again, Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. And as a part of our worship service, this scripture, it embeds the attitude and the desire for worship. So if you can, recite this with me, Psalms, or excuse me, Colossians 3, 15 through 17. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Father God, again, we come to you this morning. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for another day that you brought us into. And I know that sometimes, Father God, the days are not the best that we think of, Heavenly Father. But you have given us the best. We just sometimes just need to realize that you have a, a plan in mind for us, that you have a purpose for us to walk into this new day. And we don't have the ability to see the infiniteness that you do, Father God. Our, our eyesight, our thinking, our, our time frame is finite. But Lord God, we thank you for continuing to carry us through each new day. And being of a person that you do not promise us another day, but you promise us the day we're in today. And that you will be with us in this day. That you will govern us and guide us through this day. And all we do is submit to you and we will be fulfilled. So Lord, as we look upon this day, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will fulfill our needs of this day. Give us this day our daily bread, O oh Lord God. And help us, Heavenly Father, to find the opportunities that you have for us. To put them before us, Heavenly Father, and not let us lose sight of your will and your way. So Father, we pray for those, Lord God, who may be suffering this morning, woken up and are not feeling well and not doing at their best. Look in on them, Father God, and give them, Lord God, whatever they need to turn that around, to make that <clears throat> jump over the obstacle that lays before them. Heavenly Father, give them, Heavenly Father, the understanding and wisdom to make the decisions that they need to make to deal with this day. And help them, Heavenly Father, to be assured that you are the one in charge, that you are the one in control, and what they do, they do in your will, they will be satisfied. So help them, Heavenly Father, if they're sick and afflicted, to bring healing upon them, Lord God, to let them rise out of their sickbed and get back to life normal. And the jobs, Father God, we pray that you will open the door of opportunity, Father God, for those who don't have a job or for those who have one, but Lord God, you want to give them another advancement. You want to give them an extra opportunity, Heavenly Father. Give them wisdom to know which door to walk into, even if you've given them multiple doors. So Father God, we just pray that you will help those who don't have a job to find one, to give them, Heavenly Father, that door to walk through. And give them, Heavenly Father, the desire to work. I know that sometimes there are people who are not working, they just don't want to work, Father. I give them a desire. We know that you don't like slothfulness, Heavenly Father. Jesus never picked anybody who wasn't working. And so, Father God, we pray that you will lead these individuals who want to work, Father God, to a job that will support their families and put the roof over their heads and keep bread on the table. And Lord, we just look to you, Father God, as we 
serve you this day. Lord God, help us to serve you. I know at times we, we don't know how to serve you, Heavenly Father. Help us to not be anemic in our service, Lord God. We, we go through the motions but not actually put in the, the heart. So help us, Heavenly Father, put in the heart. Help us, Lord God, put in the desire. Help us to glorify you in this day. And Father God, we pray for all other churches open up in Jesus' name today. That you do bless their services, Heavenly Father, and help them in their fellowship and their memberships. I know that as uh, this COVID has gone through, memberships have dropped and people have stopped coming into the church. And I know, I understand, Father God, that yes, there's a reason for it. But look upon each and every member, Heavenly Father, and help them in the support of their church, O oh Lord God, to be there for them and, and for the pastors to be there for them as well. So, Lord, we pray for your strength. We pray for your wisdom. We pray for your understanding and knowledge. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you can, turn to your neighbor, tell him it's good to see you in the house of the Lord. Amen. When night has fallen, when fear is coming, still you're calling me. When faith is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me, yeah. Decided I'm not giving up. You won't give up on me. You won't give up on me. Love is holding on. It won't let go. Feel it breaking out like an echo. Your love is holding on, it won't let go. Feel it breaking out like an echo, echo in my soul. 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 Every season, you keep repeating promises to me. Now there's no stopping what you have started until it is complete. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me, yeah. I've decided I'm not giving up. You won't give up on me. You won't give up on me. Your love is holding on. It won't let go. I feel it breaking out like an echo. Your love is holding on. It won't let go. I feel it breaking out like an echo. Echo in my soul. 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 When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. I've decided I'm not giving up. You won't give up on me. You won't give up on me. All right. Now we come to our offering, our time of giving. When God says he takes care of your daily needs, he asks that you take care of his church and it says to give back a little bit into the storehouses that the Lord has set aside so as we come now to this time of offering if you're on our website www.onefaithonechrist.org you can press the give button and that'll open up a window and you can use credit cards PayPal and such 
or on your bank account using Zelle. Just use info at onefaithonechrist.org. And if you are in the area or you want to mail them in, our address is 1327 East Miritania Street, Wilmington, California, 90744. And I know that there's other means of electronic payments that you can use. And like I said, some are using direct deposit into our accounts. Some are setting up payment plans through their banks and sending them to the church. We just love the way God has given us so many ways for uh, people to provide their tithes and offerings. So if there's a way that you want to use an electronic service, uh, email me at info at onefaithonechrist.org and we can help set you up if you want to give to this church. And as always, we're thankful for your offerings. We're thankful for your giving. And we pray that God will richly bless you for your giving to return to you the things that you have given to him. And we just thank you for this. Father God, we thank you for this offering that we've received today. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your wonderful blessings and grace upon us that we are able, Lord God, to operate this church, to operate the internet services that we have to fulfill your desire and glory for us to preach and teach to the entire world. And you've given us that opportunity to do so. And so, Father God, we pray that these offerings will continue to support that. And we pray that you bless each and every giver. And for those who couldn't give, Father God, we pray that indeed that you continue to bless them and help them, Heavenly Father, in their daily needs to get them, Heavenly Father, back on their feet. So we thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials? Have we trials? Temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend? Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus. to the Lord in prayer. What a friend, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. And to care. Things 
you got. Come on, let's sing it one more time. What a friend, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. to God in prayer. All right. Now we bring ourselves to the message this morning. I'll have to say it's going to be a controversial one. But I'll have to say this, it's the one that God has impressed upon my mind all week to deal with. And I'm like, really? You really want me to talk about this? And so our message this morning is homosexuality, what the Bible says about it. So yes, we're going to tackle this subject today and as it deals with the Christian community, I have to ask this question. Does Jesus condemn or condone homosexuality? Right. Now, it may seem strange and even foolish that I should even ask such questions. Now, I'm saying that from my perspective, it's meaning that I know what the Bible talks about and I've read these passages and, and understand it. So I'm asking this question for you to kind of frame this in your minds. Does Jesus condemn or condone homosexuality? Aren't the, crypt, aren't the scriptures clear on this subject? Apparently not. If you listen to the many voices now embracing this lifestyle and you're looking at our government trying to push it upon us and we look at churches that are being accepting of it, there are scholars and theologians and the media is even, you know, uh, so this may be at some point labeled hate speech. Although I am coming directly from the Bible, I am not adding my opinion. And that is the purpose here. But we see where this is leading to. And so there are scholars and theologians who admittedly try to defend their homosexual lifestyle based on the scriptures. While some do not believe that homosexual behaviors even mentioned are described in scripture, others freely admit that it is mentioned and was a, was a capital crime under the laws of Moses and strongly condemned by the apostle Paul as being worthy of death. And Paul mentioned that in Romans, that it was worthy of death. But among the latter, it is argued that neither of these condemnations in the Old or New Testament applies to the homosexual believers in Christ. So there are homosexuals who call themselves Christians, and we're to say that they are okay. There's no problem. Now that was a twist we will examine carefully in this sermon, as most of you have probably never heard of such a defense of the homosexual lifestyle. That the Bible doesn't say, uh, that the Bible says nothing about homosexuality for a Christian. And I'm going to say, I don't know what they were reading, but I'm going to bring you a scripture that lays it out pretty clear. So go with me to Romans chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 18 through 27. And I know it's a large chunk, but I also want to keep everything in context here. And for this large chunk, I'm going to break it down a little bit later. So Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 27. 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were, nor were thankful, <clears throat> but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. And birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use of what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Now right there, New Testament speaks of homosexuality, both for men and for women. But before I go any further, let me explain why I'm giving this sermon. Outside of what God wants me to do. My purpose here is not to judge, not to single out or come down on those living the homosexual lifestyle, but to enlighten so that we as Christians will know the truth and for those living the homosexual lifestyle to also know the truth. And in both cases, a choice needs to be made. And what I want to do is establish to you whether the Bible treats homosexuality as a sin or not. That is my goal. To see if the Bible says so. And if you're a Christian, you believe in the Bible. And believing in that Bible, you need to follow its precepts. And if so, then for us as Christians... We need to treat it the same way we do for other sins called out in the Bible. Just as it does for stealing, giving false witnesses, fornication, etc. <clears throat> and that is to continue to pray for all those who desire to come out of the bondage and slavery of this lifestyle. The same thing we do for those who steal, those who are fornicators. We first put it to prayer and let God work on them. We don't necessarily go Bible thumping to force them into a particular way. We want God to work and then God to move in us to do what he desires us to do after that. And if it is not a sin and these practices are normal and virtuous, then we should not be speaking or discriminating against them. I use that word discriminating very loosely here because if it is not a sin, then we are discriminating. But if it is a sin, then we're not discriminating. Okay? And if it is a sin, then we should carefully speak out against it just as we should against adultery, idolatry, lying, stealing, etc. So let's try and look at the scriptural facts with unbiased, open minds. Let's Let's read the scripture and see what the scripture says and understand what God has written and God has given us and utilize that. If we are interested in obedience to Jesus Christ, then we should be eager to know the truth one way or another. Amen? So I'm going to approach this by giving you some of the common arguments 
that those who practice this lifestyle, as well as those that agree with this lifestyle, have given in argument to homosexuality and the Bible and the Christian life. I'm only going to actually look at two. There's a, there's a lot, but I only want to look at the two most common ones today. The first and most popular argument is Jesus never addressed homosexuality. I remember a co-worker when I worked at this company called Key3 Media. We had an office in Boston and an office in uh, Los Angeles, and she was in Boston. And we had an occasion to talk on the phone, and she mentioned that her and her wife are Christians. And I said, hey, hold on. How can that be? If the Bible speaks out against homosexuality and the biblical relationship of marriage is a man and a woman, how can you say this? And she said, Jesus never talked about it. And Paul's a homophobe. And I'm like, whoa, you weren't even there to know Paul. How do you know he's a homophobe? And then I said, Jesus did talk about it. She hung up. So I said, okay. I'm not going to call her back and you know, deal with this subject. That's, she wants to deal with it that way. That's fine. So dealing with this first argument, Jesus never addressed homosexuality. Jesus did address this subject. And sometimes we get lost because the words homosexual, homosexual and lesbian are not in the Bible. That's actually crude street terms that we've created. God gets down to the nitty gritty, the subject matter itself. So Jesus did address this subject. And not specifically calling out homosexuality, but by going to the root of what God, God calls a relationship. See, a lot of times we read scripture, we don't realize that Jesus cuts through all of the minutia that we put in, and he goes right to the point. Because once you get right to the point, the other stuff falls away. So he gets to the point of relationship. Okay? First, understand this. As far as God is concerned, the only relationship that can involve sexual activity is a marital relationship. God looks at anything else as fornication. If you're not in a married situation, intimacy of that nature, God considers fornication. And which is considered sin, a sex outside of marriage. So God only looks at marriage and ordained marriage under God. Okay. Now, this is where Jesus deals with the matter. He deals with it in a couple places, but I chose this one for our example. Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 6. Now, here's where he deals with it, okay? Matthew 19, 3 through 6. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and him is Jesus, saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. So yes, this is about divorce, but for divorce to happen, you have to have a marriage. So Jesus speaks of marriage as that which God created in the very beginning of time back in Genesis chapter 2, a man and a woman. He did not create any other marriage type. A relationship entered into by a man and a woman. The only marriage that God recognizes is the one he created at the very beginning. God is the author of marriage, not man. So man does not have the right to decide what marriage is. 
This is where Jesus places the homosexual, homosexual lifestyle into the sin of fornication. Once he kicks that out of marital relationship, it is nothing but fornication. Okay? And he even calls out later that that particular type of fornication is an abomination. And he also speaks of it in Matthew chapter 5 and also in Mark 10. Now, just because the words homosexual and lesbian are not in the Bible, it does not mean that it is not addressed. Pedophilia is not in the Bible, but yet it's addressed. When Jesus talks about harming little children or abusing little children, and I know that little children scripture works for both the new believer as well as the literal child. God set the rules that govern marriage some 6,000 years before our modern day LGBTQ movements started. Liberal, progressive worldviews and has not given man the authority to change that. Okay? So nowhere in the Bible that God said, I'm giving you authority to change the description of marriage and its design. God said, no. In the very beginning, I created marriage between a man and a woman, and that is it. So think about this. Why do we have the Old Testament? Do you ever wonder? Why do we have the Old Testament? In short, it shows us that God singled out an ethnic group of people, Hebrews, giving them instructions on how to not live like the world does, setting up moral, civil, ceremonial, and judicial laws that show a separation between them and the rest of the world. So God gave us this Old Testament to show what he wants in a people, how this people will act differently than the rest of the world as we call Gentiles. And also, it provides for us today an example of what God wants to teach us today. We look at the Old Testament, and sometimes I say, I look at the Old Testament and it tells us what not to do because the children of Israel didn't always obey, didn't always do what they were told. But the premise is there, that God showed us the Old Testament to say, here is what I want as a people if they follow these rules. Now, although we are under the New Testament covenant, it still carries over the moral, civil, and judicial laws of the Old Testament. We don't deal with the ceremonial stuff that was left with the children of Israel. But the moral ones carried over. The moral ones are contained in the, in the, in the Ten Commandments. The civil ones are contained in the Ten Commandments. And the judicial is contained in the Ten Commandments. Those are carried over into the Ten Commandments. Because Jesus mentioned all of the Ten Commandments but one. And that was the fourth. And the reason he didn't mention the fourth was because he is our Sabbath rest. So he didn't mention it because he is our Sabbath day's rest. Now, all of those moral, civil, and judicial laws that were given to the children of Israel, and I say all so that I can introduce a moral law that is still in effect for us. So remember, the moral laws that were given still work today. The civil laws given still work for us today. And actually, most of our judicial laws are taken from the Bible. So, Here's one of those moral laws that I'm going to mention because the people who say that there is no mention of homosexuality for the Christian will say, yes, this particular scripture does apply to back then, but it doesn't apply today. And I'm going to explain why it does. First of all, the moral laws of then apply to the moral laws of today. So let's look at Leviticus Chapter 20, Leviticus 20, verse 13. It says, if a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be 
surely put to death. So back then it was very clear. If you practice homosexuality, you were to be put to death. Okay? So some have said, well, that doesn't apply to us. That's Old Testament. I said, it does. Because it's one of the moral laws that still applies today. Okay? Now you may be saying, hey, that's Old Testament stuff. So how does it apply to Jesus? Again, the, the application is, how does that apply to Jesus? Okay. Well, we know that Christ Jesus is a member of the Godhead. He is the Son in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus himself said, the Father and I are one. The Bible also tells us that God wrote the Bible with the Holy Spirit using men to write down the words into books that we call the Bible. So it says the Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit, by chosen people to write it down. God wrote it, God created it, and God had man write it down. Okay? Now, where does Jesus come into that? Since God wrote it, Jesus and God are one. The Holy Spirit inspired it, Man wrote it. So then Jesus is called the Word. You know, if you think about what God does, there's a lot of wordplay going on in the Bible. Jesus is the Word. And what does that mean? The Word is the embodiment of what God wants us to know. And Jesus gave us all that. And John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, tells us something crucial about the Word. John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Now, going back to our opening scripture that speaks very clearly about the sin of a homosexual lifestyle, understand this. Paul, the writer of this epistle, is an apostle of Christ Jesus, and he speaks about what Jesus has taught them. So the apostles carry on what Jesus had taught them and wanted them to teach to us. And to the one who carries on the ministry that Jesus left when he died on the cross. So the Apostle Paul carried on what Jesus wanted to teach, as well as Peter, as well as James, and as well as John. They were all taught things by Jesus. And so they are, by extension, speaking for Jesus just as you and I do when we preach the gospel ourselves. We are an extension of Jesus Christ. So when Paul gave us that opening scripture, it was as if Jesus spoke it himself. Okay. So now we've kind of nailed it down, Old Testament, moral, into the New Testament. Paul, apostle of Jesus Christ, speaking these words, Jesus Christ. So Christ Jesus was there at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the cities in between because of what he said was a sin, so it's very grave. He said what they were doing in those cities was sinful to the magnitude of whatever the highest you can get. It was a sin is very grave. This, this sin is so horrible. And if we read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, we'll find out what that sin is. It was homosexuality. These men of the city, they came when they found out that there was angel or these new men come into the city. And they came to Lot's house and they wanted to meet these new angels. They, we know them as angels, but the people saw them as gorgeous men. And some have said, oh, they just wanted to meet them and talk to them because they were new people in the city. I said, no, you got to read that very carefully. 
because Lot said, don't do this horrible thing. So if you just want to meet and greet, what's horrible about that? Lot knew these men were coming to have intercourse with these new men of the city. And to make it even clearer, the men said, you let us do what we want to do or we'll do worse to you, is what they told Lot. So again, if it's just a meet and greet, what is the worst you can do? I'm going to talk you to death. I'm going to tell you stupid jokes until, you know, you can't take it anymore. That's not a meet and greet. They wanted to do what they wanted to do. And because God said this is a sin very grave, this is a sin, homosexuality, that had run rampant through the two main cities. And when God destroyed those two main cities, which were a little bit apart, he destroyed all the cities in between as well. Because as people traveled in between those two cities, they spread that homosexual lifestyle. So God said, nope. That was an abomination. It was, it was too grievous. So now we see where Jesus did talk about it, where Jesus had an understanding of it. So I hope I have laid that argument to rest. The second argument is that of homosexual orientation, meaning this is a belief that homosexuality is assigned at birth and cannot change. And I'm going to use this word immutable, meaning unchangeable. You can't change it. I'm born this way. Nothing you can do about it. Nothing I can do about it. It's done, it's done. Now, you may have noticed that I continue to use the words homosexual lifestyle. And all through this, I have used that term instead of using the word homosexual. And understand this. My reason for this is the same reason why I use the word belief. Like I said, this is a belief that the homosexual is assigned at birth. In the orientation argument, here's my rationale. The homosexual does not exist as a born person. So if we know that you are not a born person, you cannot be a homosexual, which denotes an entity created at birth. Now, I know you may be astonished about what I just said, but it is the truth. We are born with immutable characteristics. We are born with immutable characteristics, such as our race, black people, Samoans, white, Asian. You're born that way, and you can't change that. That's the immutable characteristic, okay? And there are things about our race that we cannot change. There are things about our race that we cannot change. And, and I know there's a joke about black people loving fried chicken and whatnot. And I mention that because my younger son, being half black, half Chinese, he loves fried chicken. <laughs> Anywhere we go, it's like either KFC or Popeye's. That's the only place he really wants to eat. <laughs> But I, you know, again, you know, all jokes aside, that is not an immutable characteristic of, of, of black people. I'm just, just to poke some humor here, okay? But anyway, there are some characteristics about us that we cannot change, okay? And it goes on with our, our race, that we have certain things that are part of that and it's not changeable, okay? We are born with them and that's the way it is. So to say that there is a homosexual means that they have an immutable characteristic, meaning that one practicing homosexual lifestyle has an immutable characteristic that they are that way and cannot change. But we know from science and medicine that there is no one that is born a homosexual. Studies have been done, looked over it very carefully, and nope can't find a gene, can't find a DNA, can't find anything that would denote an individual as homosexual, unless they told you or someone told you they were. 
So if you did an autopsy of a person, you could not find anything in them that says they were homosexual. From science, medicine, sociology, and psychology, we know that the entity we call a homosexual is just someone who performs the act of homosexuality, living the homosexual lifestyle. Okay? So, if homosexuality is a gene or DNA-related issue, if they were born that way, then Houston, we've had a problem. And what is that problem? Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. And remember, Paul is speaking as an extension of Jesus when he writes this to the Corinthians, to the people of Corinth. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Do you know that the unrighteousness, excuse me, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetousness, covetousness nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Okay, let that sink in a minute. So if you're born, you say you have this immutable gene and DNA that you are born homosexual. Paul just called you out and said, you are going to be damned to hell. So notice a couple of things here. This list begins with them all being covered under the term unrighteousness. So all of these things listed here are considered unrighteous acts and unrighteousness. And Paul says none of them are inheriting the kingdom of God, which means that left in this state, they will not make it into heaven. And note that the word homosexuals used in this passage is used in the same way that the word effeminate, which is found in the King James Version. And both of these words here, because back then the term homosexual was not a word yet. Homosexual didn't come into play until much later and understand it was a German who invented the term homosexual and homosexuality because the term sodomite didn't sound so good. Okay. So this is written so that we can understand this, but the real word is effeminate. And the word effeminate is a reference to a man having characteristics and ways of behaving traditionally associated with women and regarded as inappropriate for a man. So when we were growing up, the effeminate term we called someone a sissy because he acted like a woman. He was acting like a girl. As far as, you know, in our teenage life growing up, this guy's a sissy growing up acting like a woman. This is what the Bible says, infeminate, excuse me, effeminate, that the person acting like a woman, being a man acting like a woman, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So God does not create a person to be born to damnation. So we need to understand that. God did not create people so that they will be forced into damnation. So that's why I say Houston we've had a problem. If the Bible is true, and we know the Bible is, and you say that homosexuality for the Christian is fine, and I was born that way, then we have a problem. Either the Bible's wrong, or you're wrong. Because that would put you in a situation that, according to the Bible, you were born to go to hell. Not even Satan was created for damnation. God did not create Satan for damnation. God created Satan. He was the worship leader of, of heaven. But it was he himself who caused the change 
in his destination. It was Satan who decided that. So again, if you were believed that you were born in, uh, as a homosexual, then you got a problem because the Bible says you're going to hell and now you got to reconcile the fact that, okay, God created you for damnation. But again, God did not do that. And that's why the, the, the scripture I read earlier talked about the lust of their hearts, their desire to do certain things. They decided to change the truth of God into a lie. They decided to make this determination that, I don't care what the Bible says, I'm going to force people to believe that it doesn't say that, that it means something different. Now, notice the last portion of the scripture I just read you from 1 Corinthians. And this is, a, this is also to prove that it is not a, an immutable characteristic, okay? And this last portion of our scripture we just read, it said, And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of God. Now, this says that they were, and the key word were, one of those sinners in that list. So Paul says, you were one of those sinners that I listed off. And that's interesting word, were. But through repentance and a changing of your lifestyle, or their lifestyle to follow Jesus Christ, they were washed and came into the kingdom of God. So Paul says, because you decided to repent and change, you're no longer a fornicator. You're no longer a homosexual. You're no longer a sodomite. Only because you decided to change. So that means there is no immutable characteristic. It can be changed. Which is proof that the one practicing the homosexual lifestyle can be changed, bringing both into the marvelous light of Christ Jesus. But that change has to happen with them. For them to decide, okay, I receive the truth of this. I accept the truth of this. And I don't want to be this way anymore. Now, when I was pastor of, of a church true light we had a, a guy come in there he's gay I didn't know he was gay until a little bit after but he'd always come in drunk he would always come in drunk on Sundays every Sunday he'd come in drunk and sometimes he would come and sit in my office and that's when I found out he was homosexual and he would talk to me and he's like telling me that you know life is hard and he's drunk now he's speaking to me drunk and he doesn't like the way things are going. And so we talk and find out. And that's when I find out he's homosexual. And so there are people in the church who didn't want him there. And that's what he would say, too. He says, oh, you guys don't want me around here. I said, no. I said, you need to be here. I want you to continue to come every Sunday. He says, but there people don't like me. I said, well, they're going to have to get over it. And I said, I said, I prefer you here than them. I said, I'll, I'll sooner kick them out than kick you out. And so him and I continued to talk. And I didn't beat him up about homosexuality. I really didn't talk about it at all, to be honest with you. I just dealt with him coming to church drunk. I said, you know, you need to fix this. And I said, once, that, once you get a clear mind, then everything else will start falling into place. So, lo and behold, through prayer and, like I said, some conversation with him, he started, oh, he used to come in with uh, jeans and a T-shirt. He started coming in with a suit and tie. He was no longer drunk. And then later on, uh, just before I left, he kind of alluded the fact that he's no longer in that lifestyle. Christ has changed him and he's, he's different now. But it was not until after I left that the, some church members that um, eventually left that church told me that, that that gentleman had totally cleaned up his life. He was no longer homosexual. He was no longer a drunkard. 
He was now crucial of the church the way they were because I'm, I'm sorry, True Light at that time was really bad. And he was crucial. So he got into the, such a mindset and a change from the way he was that he now started to recognize the wrongdoings that were around him. Before, he didn't care. It's like he was drunk, didn't, you know, drunk, homosexual, didn't care. Now it mattered to him because his Christian walk depended upon being around people who were walking right as well. So I look at that and say that it can be changed. I have seen it changed. Now I'll tell you about another one. Now, this is back when I was in sixth grade. And when we used to use the term sissy, there was two guys we knew that were, we called sissies. One of them's name was Slade and another name was Vincenti. Those two were together. Now, back then, we just knew that they were sissies, but we didn't realize the magnitude of that. We didn't realize that those two had a sexual relationship. We didn't, uh, I'm sixth grade, we didn't, you know, that kind of concept didn't come to our mind, but we just knew that they were different. And I have to admit, I was a bully back then. I picked on Slade all the time because he was the sissiest of the both. And I'll say this, years later, years, years, years later, in my late 20s, I moved to Sacramento. And while in Sacramento, I was shopping in this Safeway, I believe. And I turned down this aisle, and there's a guy standing there, and he's doing this. And I look at him, I go, Slade Wilson. <laughs> I remembered him from sixth grade. And Slade's still <laughs> gay as can be. So we kind of met, and he's, and he's like, Kelvin McKissick. And we talked for a minute, and then he wants to introduce me to his boyfriend and, and ask me if I can give him his number. I said, no. <laughs> I said, we'll just meet up whenever. <laughs> and so, so I depart from there. I got my groceries. I go. The problem is, is when I moved to Sacramento, I moved in this area I didn't realize. I moved to an area called Lavender Hills. I didn't think about that. <laughs> Lavender Hills was the gay part of Sacramento. And there I am in the middle of this place. And I'm like oblivious to most of it. And I, I think about this because I think God prepared me for times like this and that time to deal with that individual at, um, at uh, True Light. Because while I lived in this apartment in, in Lavender Hills, there was a gentleman who lived in a home down below me. He helped me move my stuff in because... Out of all the days I, when I moved into the place, I thought I would go to like Home Depot, find day laborers. On this particular day, there was no day laborers available. So I asked this gentleman to help me. I give him 20 bucks if he helped me carry up some stuff. He helped me and then we had a friendship again. I did not know. He invited me to a party. So I go to his house and this party starts and guys show up. And so I'm like, where are the women at? More guys show up. More guys show up. Guys start kissing. I'm like, I got to get out of here. This is not my kind of party. So I excuse myself, and, and later on he talks to me, and he, said, he lets me know that he is homosexual. I said, okay. I'm not a part of that, but okay. So again, I mentioned him, and I mentioned, I'm going to mention this, and then we're going to get back to Vincenti. I was on a date with a girl, and we were at this cafe, and we were sitting outside, and I went in to get our stuff. And as I come out, I'm looking down, and this guy walks by, and, you know, I don't say anything, and, he, and it's Slade Wilson. <laughs> Kelvin, you're not going to say hi to me? <laughs> and my girlfriend looks at me, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, Slade, I'm sorry. <laughs> and she, now i got to explain to her <laughs> what's going on. And so she's like, whoa, from the sixth grade? And <laughs> I said, yeah. Well, anyway, Vincenti Brownlee was Slade Wilson's buddy. Vincenti was also different. 
But today, I have conversations with Vincente Brownlee. Vincente Brownlee is a Christian. He has given up the homosexual lifestyle. So again, there are two people that I know personally that claim to be homosexual but then realize that it is not immutable. That through the power of Christ Jesus, it can be changed. So again, that argument about it being born, I can tell you two stories where that's not true. They claimed it, that they were born that way. So we know this from scientific medicine and psychology that it's environmental. Someone becomes that way because of the environment they're in where parents aren't helping to shape them. And so this brings us back to our opening scripture. I didn't talk about it much, but now I'm going to tie it back in. In Romans chapter 1, which said that for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. And then goes on to call this unrighteousness vile passions. So now we tie in the lust with unrighteousness and, wi and, and with ungodliness is these passions that are vile, according to God. And he says, for even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burnt in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty there of their error which was due. So taking that, and as I just told you about, Jesus did speak about homosexuality. Homosexual orientation is not true. Some of you and people have argued that this does not mean what it says. The scripture I just read you does not mean what it says. And I like this term I'm going to use right here. Come on, man. Let's use some common sense here and read it for what it is. What is the natural use can this be speaking of? What is the natural use? Is it talking about the eyes? Is it talking about the natural use of the ears? Natural use of the feet, the hands? He said they exchanged those. Since it applies to both men and women who burned with lust for the same gender. So to get to the point, the natural use refers to their genitalia. Let's cut right to the point. Men use theirs with men, and women use theirs with women. The wrath of God is directed at you if you practice homosexuality. That's what it says, both male and female. Because one person even told me that lesbianism is not mentioned in the Bible. There you go. It's mentioned right there. The Bible says that it all boils down to lust and lusting after flesh. And in our opening scripture, we talked about how they burned in their own lust, changing what God had designed into what they wanted. Heterosexual men are just as weak when it comes to lusting after women as homosexuals are when it comes to lusting after members of the same gender. So lusting is one part of it. And God even calls out about lusting after people. So wouldn't that include the homosexual as well? So I'm again, there's another angle you pointing at this. That your homosexual lust, since it can't be categorized under marriage, it's some other thing now. And that uh, some other thing works its way into fornication, which is that lusting after something else and being with something else outside of the bounds of marriage. 
Now, some of us may have friends, co-workers, or family members who live the homosexual lifestyle. We may have. What do we do? And what that means for you is this. You don't need to stop loving them, and you don't need to stop being compassionate to them, but you can agree to disagree with their lifestyle. Now, I've known some homosexual to this day. I, can dis I agree to disagree with their lifestyle. They're still a human being. They're still afforded the same rights and things as a human being. But don't tell me that your lifestyle I have to accept. And if they want to talk about it, let them know gently that you do not agree with that lifestyle and there is a way out if they choose to. So like I said, I'm not browbeating anybody with the Bible on this subject. Like I said, that individual at True Light, we, did never, we never talked specifically about homosexuality in the Bible. But we did talk about righteousness before God and he instinctively knew what that was. He was in the church enough to know that that was something he should not do. And as you, and if you uh, come upon the need to talk with somebody who is in a homosexual lifestyle, God will lead you. The Holy Spirit will guide you into what to say and what not to say. The last thing we want to do is to shame them. I don't want to shame anyone, actually. Anyone in caught in some kind of sin, I don't want to shame you for it. The idea is to gently lead you out of it if you choose to be led out of it. And the only way that I know of to break these sins and have victory over them is for God to empower you with a greater motivation to live righteously than to live unrighteously. It's all in his hands, not mine. I can point you to certain things. I can point you to certain areas. But you have to have the desire and work with God on that motivation to change. Now, we've talked about homosexuality, but this, what I'm saying now in the end here, the only way that I know to break these sins works for all sins, okay? Any sin that you may find yourself going through, the motivation through God is how it's going to work. And yes, sometimes the counseling and talking with others will help. If what you desire is to live righteously, then there is only one source that you need to go to for help. And that source is Christ Jesus. He is the one that can help you. I can't, per se, help you. You have to start wanting to help yourself. And in wanting to help yourself, you will rely on me to help you get to Christ Jesus. Now, all I can do is point you to him. You have to now accept him and work on that relationship with him so that that source can help you through your sins. But like I said, it has to be a desire on your part. You are the initiator. Christ is the receiver, and he is always waiting. Okay? It is... God's desire that all men to be saved, but all men don't want to be saved. And that includes women as well. So if you want to accept Christ and you want to start that relationship and you want to start moving away from that sin you're in, you need to make that determination today that you want to make that initiation to Christ and ask him to be a part of your life, to come into your life, and then the two of you will work out your soul salvation. So if you want to accept Christ today and you want to move away from that sin that you're in or multiple sins that you're in, I'm going to lead you in a prayer of acceptance. And if you believe this in your heart and truly are sincere about your desire to repent, then follow this prayer and say it. So wherever you're at, if you're driving, pull over. And say this prayer with me. 
Father God in heaven, forgive me of my sins. Break the chain of sins in my life. Thank you for sending your son who died for me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and make me the person you want me to be. Remove every shackle and every chain that binds me as I come to you freely. In your precious name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. This is where we talked about that. You were one of those in that list, but now you are not. This is your start to work your way out of that by accepting Christ Jesus. And so in accepting Christ Jesus, you need to have, have your walk with him. So we're here to help in whatever way we can. Our church is 1327 East Muritania Street, Wilmington, California, 90744. If you want to come to the church or if you want to send us correspondence through the mail, that's our email, that's our church physical address. Go to our website, www.onefaithonechrist.org, and you can find out information about us, our church phone number, or even my cell number where you can directly contact me. And it also has our church uh, email address. And you can find out about the church, our services, our different ministries that we have. And you can in- email the church at info at onefaithonechrist.org if you have questions, concerns, comments, or you need resources. We have Bibles that we are willing to give you. We have other material, Bread of Life books for your devotional life. And whatever it is that we can provide that helps you with your walk with, with Jesus Christ, we are empowered by God to give you. Okay? So it's up to you. You have a resource. And we're more than happy to help you. We're not turning anyone away. And as far as your life in Christ, we need to start doing certain things. Bible study. You need to start understanding what the Bible says. Now, I know if you're first-time believers, it's daunting that the Bible is overwhelming. I remember when I first became a Christian, I looked at this and I thought, I'll never understand this stuff. And the thing is, is there's still a lot of it I don't understand because God did not give me yet the understanding of some of these parts and pieces. But as I read it and as I go through it, God gives me understanding. And so our Bible study is geared toward giving you a greater understanding. So we have our studies on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and Fridays at 7 Pacific Standard Time. On Wednesdays, we're going through the book of Matthew and we find ourselves at chapter 5 this week. And on Fridays, we're doing Exodus. I think we're chapter 29. Yep, chapter 29 this week. And Wednesdays is more expository style. I'll show you presentations, and I'll speak a lot. And then you can ask questions after uh, one of the slides or a couple slides. On Fridays, I actually send you out questions. Now, the questions just help you to break down the scriptures that that we're looking at. We usually look at a chapter at a time. But in Matthew 5, since it is a long beatitude, it's long, we're going to break it up into two or three sections. So the questions I send out on Fridays, I will send them out before Fridays, again, are to help you to break down the scriptures. I don't ask complicated questions. I just ask you to, a question related to that scripture, and you can find most of it there, and I'll try to give you helpful information so that you can dig it out. And then we'll come together on Friday and discuss it. And there's no wrong answer, and I'm not going to test you on it. We're just going to come together, discuss it, and then we're going to work it to the right answer. If, if indeed you don't, you don't have that or you're missing pieces, I'll add on to it. 
So start your Bible study. We have a, a facility here at this church. And next you need to <clears throat> work on your prayer life. You need to start talking with Jesus. Have a little talk with Jesus. He'll make everything right. So we have our prayer meeting on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we use a conference call. So you get on your phone and you call in at 7 p.m. And there's the number for United States, 657-390-4716. And if you need to, email me at info at onefaithonechrist.org so I can send you the uh, link to our, oh no, I'm sorry, <laughs> not the link. That's, actually I missed it on the Bible study, don't go back, we're okay. The Bible study, you need to send me uh, your, uh, an, e an email at info at onefaithonechrist so that I can send you the link to the Zoom meeting for the Bible study. Again, info at onefaithonechrist.org and I will send you back a, a link to our Zoom meetings for Thursdays, or excuse me, Wednesdays and Fridays. For our prayer meetings, here's the number. 657-390-4716. Call in and you'll be joined into our prayer meeting where you can give prayer requests or if you want to ahead of time, send them to info at onefaithonechrist.org and we'll tee up your prayer requests for that Thursday's prayer meeting. And you can call in, you can join by praying with us or just listening, submitting your prayer requests and listening, either one. And if you're international, we have international numbers that we currently are <clears throat> know of. If you're one of those countries and you don't have and you're, you haven't joined us, there's the number there for you. And if you're from a different country that's not listed, email me at info at onefaithonechrist.org and let me know. And I will add you to our list with a number. And also for these numbers, uh, if you want to be a part of our prayer meeting, you have to email me and I will send you um, an access code that will allow you to use this number for our prayer meetings. And so, I hope this message was helpful for us today to see the truth in the Word of God. And what we came up with from the scriptures is that Jesus does not condone it. He condemns it. But you can change. You can be different. So Lord God, we thank you for this time that we've had today. We thank you for the worship, Father God. We thank you for the praise. We thank you for your being with us here in this house, oh Lord God. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you anoint each and every individual here and bless them, Heavenly Father, on their journey back to whatever destination they're going to, Lord, to cover and keep each individual. And those that are watching in the future through archives, may the Lord bless your endeavors as you strive to follow and keep Lord Jesus in your heart. And Father God, we look upon you this day to guide and keep us in your son's name. May the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. As we all say together, amen. God bless you.